A squash the size of a washing machine, a beet the size of a football, and a pumpkin the size of a golf cart. We challenge you to guess how much it weighs. Welcome to the Alaska State Fair, where giant, I mean giant, veggies take center stage. But how on earth do these veggies get so big? And there has got to be a story here, some fascinating route to how this tradition started. The answer might surprise you, and it has everything to do with the most interesting government experiment you've never heard of. Giant veggies and mysterious history aside, this fair is a trip, chock full of things you can only experience in Alaska. Like, ever wonder how you skin a seal? Come along with us and let's go to the fair. All right, let's start with the stars of the show. This is insane. These vegetables are crazy huge. Now, we know it's a little hard to see their true scale when you're looking at footage, so here's some perspective. Here is your average grocery store beet, weighing in at just over half a pound. Here is the first place winner at the 2023 Alaska State Fair, 18 pounds. Here are a few rutabagas at the grocery store, about three quarters of a pound. And here is this year's winner. Here is a normal cabbage, about three pounds, versus the winner this year, weighing in at 119. The runner-up cabbages weren't too far behind. And here is the biggest squash I could find at the supermarket, you know, weighing in at about three and a half pounds. And now check out this beast. The Alaska State Fair is famous for two main things. One, it's drop-dead gorgeous setting. I mean, it's kind of cool to ride the Ferris wheel to the backdrop of the Chugach Mountains. But even more than this epic setting, the Alaska State Fair is famous for those giant veggies. How on earth did they grow so big? And when did this get started? We are wondering the same thing, and we cannot believe what we found. Rewind to 1929, and the bottom falls out of the U.S. economy. Part of President Roosevelt's New Deal includes an ambitious resettlement program to get the unemployed off government assistance and back to the land. Cooperative colonies are established across the country, entirely new communities built from the ground up, providing land, homes, and a promised opportunity to start anew. A community is planned in Alaska, but the reasoning here is a little less altruistic. It is now the mid-1930s, and the Alaska Railroad is expanding, and it's in debt. It needs customers. At the same time, gold mining operations are swelling in Willow Creek and up the Matsu Valley. To top it all off, the military is planning new bases in the territory, not quite believing that world conflicts are over just yet. In short, there are mouths to feed and Alaska needs an agricultural base. The Matanuska Valley, with its central location, fertile flatlands, and proximity to the existing rail line, is the place. And that New Deal program might just provide the farmers. From these barren farms in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, 1,500 men, women, and children are moving. Uncle Sam is lending the money. He's taking them to greener pastures in Alaska, to fertile lands, normal climate. Here's one family ready to go. I hope when we get in Alaska that things will be better up there and I can make a living without asking anyone for help. Our ancestors weren't afraid to go in a new country. Why should we be? When we get there, I'll do my best to make a real home for my family. For years, life here has been severe. But in Alaska, 40 acres of land for each family, a $3,000 loan, farm equipment, a new chance to live. It's a 3,500-mile journey, but none are happier to go than these wives and mothers who close a cheerless door behind them for the last time. Pioneers of the 20th century. 
200 families from Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan are selected to build a colony in Alaska. They pack up everything and travel first by train, then by steamship, arriving in the Matanuska Valley in two waves on May 9th and May 23, 1935. First tent homes and then permanent homes are built for them. Lots are drawn for land. And a mad scramble ensues to build everything before winter. By summer 1936, an entire community is built, complete with a hospital, school, warehouse, creamery, trading post, and railroad depot. In that first year, many families leave, frustrated with project mismanagement. Those that take their place, along with those that do stay, do exactly what the whole affair intended. They farm. The Matanuska colony established the foundation for what will grow into the agricultural heart of Alaska. Today, you see pieces of this history throughout Palmer, especially downtown. You can visit the old train depot and engine, a nod to the role played by the early Alaska Railroad in the establishment of this community. And if you're really intrigued by this history, you have to step inside the colony house. This museum is one of the original colony homes, and here you can walk through the past and glimpse into the lives of this settler community. The volunteers who staff the museum are the grandkids of the first colonists, and they love to share passed down stories from the early years. The history here is real, recent, and remarkably well preserved and cared for. The nearby visitor center houses another museum with abounding artifacts and exhibits telling the story of this grand government experiment and how it took root here in the Matanuska Valley. Dairy grew to be a most profitable commodity of the region, with the Matanuska made a staple on Alaskan tables. We are particularly enthralled by the visitor center garden, where Alaskans don't waste any time in showing you not only their talent for horticulture, but also their generous nature and kind spirit. So how the Matanuska colony connects to the fair and those giant veggies? Well, in September 1936, a fair was put on to celebrate the first harvest of the Matanuska colony. Over the years, the community and the fair grew together, bigger and bigger and bigger, just like the size of the veggies that they could grow. In 1941, the manager of the Alaska Railroad offered a $25 prize for whoever could grow the largest cabbage for that year's fair. Their tradition continues to this day. Here are some of the all-time records. Now, the cabbages are impressive, no doubt, but in our opinion, the real showstoppers are the pumpkins. This beauty took the cake this year, weighing in at a whopping 2,023 pounds. What did you guess? Were you close? How do these veggies grow so big? Well, part of it is genetics. Only seeds that could produce a giant specimen are used. Care and dedication also play a huge role. Competitors start their transplants early and go to great lengths to tend these beasts before fair time. And the final element is the Alaskan sun. Nearly constant daylight in the summer gives these veggies nearly round-the-clock fuel to just keep growing and growing and growing. Now, crazy giant veggies aside, the Alaska State Fair is a heck of a good time. We're gonna give you a whirlwind tour highlighting our absolute favorite experiences. You'll quickly learn that it's a beautiful balance between a pretty standard American fair and elements that are purely Alaskan, those gems that you won't experience anywhere else. 
starting with Alaska Native dancing. There is an entire neighborhood block of the fairgrounds dedicated to Alaska Native culture. The gathering place is surrounded by shops of handcrafted artwork, clothing, and foodstuffs, and the people stage is graced all day long by dancing groups that have traveled, oftentimes a really long way, to share this central and deeply important part of their history and culture. It is a privilege to be able to take in their performances. We love to see that the next generation is engaged in carrying this art form forward. As educators and promoters of youth and the arts, this makes us really happy to see. Guyana, thank you. And you see the same torch being carried forward by the next generation in an exhibit that we cannot believe we get to witness. Hey, here we go. Here we got the seal. Looking really beautiful. Oh, they already gutted it for us. Okay, so here we have our seal. This is a relative medium to smaller size seal. So, like I said, the bearded seals or the uberts can be as, as tall or as long as our bodies. So sometimes seven to eight feet long, it's really big, a couple thousand pounds. This is a smaller seal. The seal forms an integral role in the subsistence practices of many Native Alaskan communities. Once again, we feel privileged that folks took the time to organize this exhibit so that we could learn and catch a glimpse into a way of life with such deep roots. The hide is the skin of the animal, and it's used for all types of um, traditional wear, and even utilitarian pieces. For example, the flipper of the seal we use for a hunting tool. In the winter time, it's really difficult to hunt a winter seal because they, animals can hear you approaching very easily. They can hear it through the ice, um, and they scare very easily. Hunters would take the flipper of the seal and use it as a scraper. Again, it is so gratifying to see the next generation carrying forward the culture and traditions of their communities. Now, on the subject of arts and culture, the passion and sheer amount of talent put on display here at the fair is impressive. Is it the long winters or the homesteader lifestyle? Maybe both. But Alaskans really pull out all the stops when it comes to working with your hands and creating beautiful works of especially functional art. And for folks to come here and take the time to set up and show us all how they create such amazing things, the product of countless hours of time and specialized skill building, it's pretty incredible. Fun fact, did you know that Jose and I are both from rural farming communities? Just thousands of miles apart, me in Wisconsin and him in Nicaragua. The point is we both grew up with fairs that feature, well, pretty much the heart and soul of a fair, livestock. I was a horse crazy girl, still kinda am, so I of course am happy to just hang with the horses. And of course you have your full gamut of other livestock, pigs, and cows, lots of really cute cows. And oh my gosh, the goats. What is it about goats that makes them so delightful? And wouldn't you know, amongst this pretty standard display of livestock, there's an Alaskan twist. Bet you've never seen a reindeer at the fair. Another fun fact, reindeer and caribou are actually the same animal. Just in the United States, we call the domesticated version reindeer. 
And then there is that goofy, playful spirit that we keep seeing over and over in Alaska. This goose is named Maverick, and his buddy is Ryan Gosling. And that cheeky, fun-loving nature is definitely on full display here at the pig races, which are exactly as they sound. that goofiness on display here in the produce building. Hey look, I found Jose Luis, the veggie version. For a place with such short summers, it's amazing to see what magic folks can wring out of such a limited growing season. And the foodstuffs. We talked in episode 17 about how seriously Alaskans take subsistence, being self-sufficient, processing a lot of their own food for the winter. Well, you see those traditions out in full force here with an amazing variety of canned jams and jellies, honey, home brews, and even homemade wines. As you know, food is a big part of the fair and we are diving in. This is the famous spinach bread truck from Talkeetna. We would have featured them in our episode about the must-see, must-do things in Talkeetna, but they were here at the fair. We are so excited to finally give it a try. Those smell amazing. Famous spinach bread. We are also super pumped to try a treat with a Native Alaskan twist. I usually treat myself to a funnel cake at the fair, but I gladly trade that out for an Eskimo pie. It features traditional Native fry bread stuffed with sweet cream cheese and topped with whipped cream, fruit, and graham cracker crumbles. It is amazing. All this fair food has us craving an IPA, and wouldn't you know that when we enter this beer tent, who is the local entertainment currently on stage? Solar Gain, playing our favorite song. We've heard this a lot, that Alaska is basically a really big small town. We're really starting to feel that, and we love it. 
Digging for gold. He's looking for gold. He's digging for gold. And speaking of small towns, if you're from one, you've probably witnessed a tractor pull. If you have no idea what is going on here, it's basically a competition to see whose tractor can pull a very heavy weight the farthest. It's actually pretty fun to watch, especially if you stroll through the tractors beforehand and make bets on who will steal the show. So here's how it works. The tractors are pulling what's called the pulling sled. The box in the back holds weight that is winched forward as the sled is pulled down the course. This increases the load until eventually the tractor can go no further. It's actually a popular American sport with national championships and everything. Strolling and exploring the massive fairgrounds, it's easy to get lost in people watching and interesting surprises around every corner. Like this booth where we watch firsthand how this artisan crafts adorable bear sculptures with nothing more than logs and a chainsaw. One particular event at a particular place seems to tie it all together. Did you know that Alaska and Japan have a special connection? Many Alaskan towns have sister cities in Japan, and in Anchorage, three public schools immerse students in the Japanese language all the way through 12th grade. This dancing group engages youth in taiko, a traditional form of Japanese drumming and dance. performing on the colony stage, right next to an original colony barn, as if to illustrate possibly our favorite part of Alaskan culture. Alaskans seem to have a special and unique talent for honoring and living traditions of the past, while also looking forward towards the future, embracing different cultures and newcomers to the state. It's a beautiful balance to witness, especially when you see those qualities so clearly in the next generation. Thank you. 
After a whirlwind day at the fair, the peace of downtown Palmer is so welcome. Once you know the history of this area, you see evidence of it all around. And that's what history does, right? It's almost more about understanding the present than about understanding the past. Because when we know where we come from, we can shape a future rooted in purpose and legacy. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give us a like. Subscribe to our channel. Send us a comment below. And for exclusive content and a behind the scenes view of the Art Read Area journey, join us on Patreon. See you over on Patreon.